So, let's see what we're going to do today. Yeah. You know what? Everybody out there was off step. That's just the way it, it was. All right. So today we're going to begin talking about um, westward expansion. A lot of it will be just simply Georgia expanding westward. Remember, um, the Treaty of Paris of 1763 greatly increases Georgia's um, land mass from the Savannah River all the way to the Mississippi River. And what we see happening beginning after the Revolutionary War, 1784 or so, is we begin to see Georgians moving westward. In fact, Georgia's population begins to move toward the west. Now, when I say west, um, we're not talking about across the Mississippi River or even to the Mississippi River. We're talking about the river that sits right out here. What is that? Come on, you live here. What is that river? The Oconee River. Um, this, in 1803, when Milledgeville is named the capital of Georgia, this was the wilderness. People did not live here. This was the frontier. This was the wild, wild west. And you had many Creek Indians still living in this area. And so um, that's one of the things we'll end up talking about. We'll talk about westward expansion, and then we'll talk about Indian removal. Um, which is a really dark spot during our nation's history. Now, let's see if we can get this to do what I want it to do, and obviously we can't. There we go. Helps if you turn it on. All right. So after the American Revolution, Georgia begins to turn its attention to growth and development. Growth in this case, meaning um, more industry, more agriculture, more people. We want people to come to Georgia. Why? Because the more people we have, the more representation we have in Congress and the more money we get, right? Because what do people who live in a state do? They pay what? Taxes. And so Georgia's trying to increase their tax base. And so what we see is expansion from the coast, from Augusta and Savannah toward this area right here, toward the Oconee River, the west, the frontier. What did I call it? The wild, wild west. You know, that used to be a television show, right? Okay. And it was a terrible movie with Will Smith. But... All right. By the way, how do you like my meth? My meth peach. He's, he's struggling, I'm telling you. All right. So Georgia grows, and it grows rapidly in several different ways. Number one, education. And you think back to when we talked about the different um, colonies that existed. The South, the one that placed the least amount of emphasis on education was the South. But yet Georgia steps to the forefront and becomes a pioneer in public education. 1784, the Georgia legislature, the General Assembly, today the Georgia General Assembly, set aside 40,000 acres of land for the University of Georgia. 40,000 acres, that's a lot of acres. How many football fields are in an acre? Do you know? Is it three? Let's find out. Shall we? I think it's three. If I was really smart, I'd use Siri, but I hate Siri, so I'm not going to use Siri. Huh, it's not even one. 
A football field itself is 1.32 acres. So it's about 0 0.75, 0 0.73%, 0 0.75 um, of an acre is a football field. No, there are 0 0.75 football fields per acre, so a little less than one. Did that make sense? That did. All right, so that would be how many football fields? About 40,000, right? A little less than 40,000. It's a lot of land. And the ironic thing is that one of those 40,000 acres is actually a football field. All right. Um, Abraham Baldwin, whom we know, the, the uh, namesake of Baldwin County, is selected to write the charter for the University of Georgia. And remember, if you are starting a business, if you're starting a church, if you're starting a school, if you break away from Georgia and create your own state, um, you have to have a charter. Basically says what you can do and what you cannot do. Okay? So Abraham Baldwin writes that charter. He would later become um, the first president after the charter is approved in 1785. No buildings. Just land. And so Georgia becomes the country's first land grant university. And that was something that got stuck on your study guide, I think. Um, that original 40,000 acres was actually sold. And the University of Georgia was given land by Governor John Millage. Again, another name that you should be familiar with. School's actually built in 1801, a couple of years before Milledgeville is named the capital. And of course, the capital city is named after the governor in 1801, John Millage. What? I believe so. You mean the school across town? Yeah, we, we don't mention that name. It's just the school across town. All right. Um, universities, um, even colleges are actually broken up into different colleges. For example, at Georgia College, you're a member of what? The School of Education, okay? Um, I actually went to the School of Business at Georgia College and then later went to the School of Education. Um, you know, if you want to be a pharmacist and you go to the University of Georgia, where are you going? You're going to the School of just your own film. Pharmacy, right? Okay. So the first college at UGA was called Franklin College, and it was pretty much a liberal arts type of education with an emphasis more than likely on what do you think? You just said it. Start it with an A. Agriculture. In fact, Georgia is still um, an agricultural school. It's one of five research institutions in the state of Georgia. Um, where you can go and do original research as an undergraduate. So if you want to do science, you want to do STEM, um, go to Georgia so that you can do original research or go to Georgia Tech or go to Georgia Southern or go to the Medical College of Georgia and do original research. Pretty cool thing. All right. So Franklin College, um, and again, as I said just a moment ago, Georgia becomes the first public land grant university in American history. What does that mean? It means the state gave land, granted land, so that the school could be created. And there's Franklin College. Buildings are still there as far as I know. So that's the oldest part of the University of Georgia. And I can honestly say I have never been there. 
I can honestly say I have no desire to go there. Some of you will want to go to the University of Georgia. Can I let you in on a little secret? It's hard to get into. It's very competitive. Very, very competitive. So if you want to, if your dream, if your goal is to go to the University of Georgia, um, you got to do the things that are necessary. And that's not just making good grades. Um, that means you've got to be involved in other things, fine arts, athletics, have a job. Because my feeling is any moron can go to school and make straight A's. It's the moron that goes to school, makes straight A's, holds a job, plays football or basketball or whatever, sings in the choir, does one-act play, all of that stuff. And that's what they're looking for, people that are well-rounded. All right, most schools are looking for that kind of thing, by the way. Even Georgia College. What did you have to do to get into Georgia College? You had to write like 17 essays and give a quart of blood. and Yeah. That means difficult. So don't think that just because you're cute and you've made good grades, you're going to get into where you want to go to school. I, well, that is true. I hadn't thought about that. They did let me in twice. Twice. All right. So one of the things that we see related to Georgia's growth is its emphasis on public education. The second thing is Georgia's five capital cities. Between the time that Georgia becomes a state and 1868, Georgia has five capital cities. And guess which way they keep moving? West. Can anybody name them? Y'all be able to name at least two. Come on. All right, here's my trick question. Was Savannah ever the state capital? Yes. Yeah. You sure? All right, five capital cities. Here's you an acronym, Salma. Savannah, 1732 to 1784. Think about that one. Was Savannah a capital, a state capital, or was it a colonial capital? Augusta from 1785 to 1795, excuse me. And you may not think Savannah's west of, or Augusta's west of Savannah, but it, it, it actually is a little bit. Louisville, who's ever heard of that one? Who's ever been to Louisville? 1796 to 1806. So we see a, a common theme with Augusta and Louisville. It's about 10 years. Um, Milledgeville from 1806. And really, it's officially the capital beginning in 1803. But why isn't it the capital in 1803? Because there's no city here. So the city has to be constructed the capitol building has to be constructed it's finally finished enough for them to move in in 1806 and they actually move in on january the 1st 1807 and it is the capital really until 1868 um and one of the things we'll talk about is why did the capital move from milledgeville to atlanta what do you think Population had something to do with it. What else? What? Mm, well, the Civil War was over. What? Okay. Huh? I mean, you got plenty of room around here. You do? Have you ridden through Baldwin County and seen all the empty land that's there? There's a lot of it. Because there's no need to. 
Atlanta was much like that in 1868. Remember, it had been burned to the ground. So in 1865, there's nothing in Atlanta. It's a big pile of ash. In fact, Atlanta's called the Phoenix City. Why? Because it resurrected itself out of its own ashes. So, all of those things are true, but probably the two biggest reasons um, have to do with transportation. If you look at this map, and I'm not going to pass it around, this is from actually 1790, or excuse me, 1895. And you, one of the things you don't see on this map are interstate highways. But what you do see are railroads. And Atlanta actually began as a railroad hub, and it grew from there. So um, transportation is a, is a reason. Yes. Figured that's why you raised your hand. Yes. How do you obtain all of these old remnants of time? You just look. You find them everywhere. All right. So the other reason that Atlanta becomes the capital of Georgia in 1868 has to do with the Civil War, but really it has to do with Reconstruction. Georgia is the last state to rejoin the Union because it would not do what it was required to do in order to re rejoin. And so in 1868, Georgians actually elect black legislators. They come here to Milledgeville. They're going to sit in the General Assembly. They're going to make law. And the General Assembly does two things, or one thing. They refuse to give them their seats. So they show up, and they're not allowed to participate. Milledgeville hotel owners, restaurant owners, won't serve black legislators. And so the military governor at the time says, hmm, okay, we'll take our ball and we'll go play in Atlanta. They'll take our money. They'll feed us. They'll house us. And sure enough, they did. And, it, and Milledgeville is economically ruined because the capital moves from Milledgeville to Atlanta. It had already been economically ruined by the Civil War, and now it's even worse. So, um, five capital cities, Salma, Savannah, Augusta, Louisville, Milledgeville, and Atlanta. And there's actually a little town in South Georgia called, anybody know? Alma. Named after? Take off the Savannah, and what do you have? the state capitals of Georgia, Augusta, Louisville, Milledgeville, and Atlanta. I blew a tire coming through Alma one July 4th on my camper on a Sunday that was July the 4th. You know how hard it was to find a tire in Alma, Georgia on Sunday afternoon? It was because it was Sunday. Thank, thank God for Western Auto. All right, so here you can see everything moves toward the west. Here's Savannah. We move a little west towards Augusta, Louisville, Milledgeville, and then finally Atlanta. All right, so that was two things, right? What was the first one? Edu education. The second one was the movement of capital cities has an impact on Georgia. Okay, so 1806, of course, um, the capital is moved west of the Oconee River, and of course, that is Milledgeville, uh, named after John Millage, who, of course, had donated the land to uh, build the University of Georgia. He had been governor during that time. So that's what you have. Y'all want to know a little bit about the Capitol building? No? Yes. Okay. So 
1807, the legislature actually moves into the Capitol building, and it did not look like that. Number one, it was a different color. It was red. Why? Because it's made out of red brick that was actually made down at the Oconee River. Um, in 1830, maybe it was 1820. In 1807, only the middle part existed. This part right here. Um, in the 1830s, early 1830s, the porticos on either end are added and the crenellation was added. The crenellation is this stuff right here. And they put a plaster skin on it. Why did they put plaster on it? Because it leaked. Because the bricks were not sun, they were not fired bricks. In other words, they weren't put in a fire and hardened that way. They were left out in the sun and they were porous. They leaked. And so they put a plaster skin on it. Finally, um, 1838, where y'all stand every morning, that was added, um, and the Capitol building was complete. Um, it's burned three different times. One um, in the 1840s, I want to say 1842 maybe. Um, there's a great story that comes out of that. There's a slave named Big Sam who's owned by a uh, prestigious businessman here in town. Um, we think what happened is sparks from the chimney. One of the chimneys caught the roof on fire. Nobody will go up on the roof to put out the fire except Big Sam. So Big Sam climbs a rickety ladder. He gets on the roof. He begins stamping out the embers. Uh, people begin to pass buckets of water to him, and he pretty much single-handedly saves the Capitol building. The state of Georgia is so thankful that they pass a resolution to buy Big Sam and give him his freedom. So they do. I think for like 1800 bucks, they purchased Big Sam. It feels so weird to talk about buying people, doesn't it? And 19 years later, Georgia gives him his freedom. So he hung around here for 19 years working at the Capitol building, doing all kinds of things. Um, the last time it burned was 1942, right after um, World War II had, had broken out. And the clock tower actually collapsed into the building. So it was, it was a pretty severe fire. Um, they rebuilt it using prison labor. And if you look at a picture of the Capitol building from like the 1980s or the 1990s, it looks very different. The clock tower is off center. It's shorter and it's fatter. Doesn't look like that one anymore or like that one. So anyway, just a little bit about the Capitol building. We may go take a visit. Ah, there you go. That's what we're used to seeing. Another little interesting tidbit. That was the first use of Gothic architecture in a public building in the United States. There you go. Like 1.3 million red bricks were used in building that building. 1.3 million, Maddie. Million. All right. It's a lot. All right. The third thing that really impacts um, Georgia's growth is the spread of the church, particularly the Baptist and the Methodist church. Prior to the American Revolution, most people in Georgia are members of the Church of England or the Anglican Church. We've talked about that before. Um, as a monarchy, the king or queen of England, even today, is actually the head of the Anglican Church or the Church of England. And so the same was true in Georgia. Most people in England members of the Church of England. Most people in Georgia were members of the Church of England. And Anglicanism, and I just said this, taught that the King of England was the head of the church. And the Anglican church got into politics. 
Anglican Church demanded that its members be loyal to the king during the revolution. I don't know about you, but that in and of itself would have caused me to be disloyal to the king. Why? Because they're telling me what I have to do. They've gone beyond theology. They've gone beyond the spiritual, and they're telling me um, what I have to believe in terms of government. During the war, you still have a lot of Anglican priests here in Georgia, and they, for the most part, identify with the Tories. After the war, they have to leave, for the most part. They're not welcomed. And remember, there's about 7,000 people, both black and white, that end up leaving Georgia in 1784, 1783, uh, because essentially they're not welcome here. They had been Tories. They had supported uh, the crown. They had been loyalists. And the Whigs, of course, knew who they were and they are forced to leave. Several of those who left were the Anglican priests. And so what's left of the Anglican church in Georgia? What's left of the Church of England in Georgia? Is there any bit of it left? There's a little bit. Because not all the priests left. Not all the priests um, supported the crown. But if they're not supportive of the crown, they have to leave the Anglican church. And so many of the Anglicans um, left the Anglican church, the Church of England, and they joined the Methodist church. And of course, John Wesley and George Whitfield were instrumental in beginning the Methodist church. In fact, if you look at old Methodist church stuff, um, a lot of it, because Wesley and Whitfield came from an Anglican background, and many of the people early on came from an Anglican background, a lot of it is Anglican. It's Church of England stuff. And of course, over the years, that's changed as the church has grown. Um, one of the things the Revolutionary War does, even though there's not a lot of fighting that takes place in Georgia, um, a lot of the churches are damaged or they're destroyed, and um, that has an impact on the people of Georgia. Why do you think that is? I mean, what's the church? It's a, it's a group of people, right? But most people think of the church as a building, right? Well, how do you have church without a building? Pretty simple, actually. You just meet. But churches in small towns, even today, um, tend to be the center of community life. And that was certainly true during the Revolutionary War, after the Revolutionary War. Really, up until the 20th century, the church in any small town was going to be the center of that community. That's where people met. That's where people um, gathered to discuss community um, things that were going on. You know, they would meet for worship. They would meet for prayer. They would meet for whatever. They would gather at the church. And so with those churches gone, there's a problem. Um, and Lyman Hall recognized that problem. Remember, sign of the declaration. He's governor in 1783, and he begins to promote the rebuilding of the churches that have been destroyed or damaged during the Revolutionary War because he understood that it's more than just a place where people meet to worship. It's, it's a place of community, and it's necessary. All right, there's John Wesley. Um, that is the ruins of a church actually on the Georgia border between South Carolina. It's actually in South Carolina, but you get the idea. Small building, um, and you can see what's left of it. 
uh, I think on Jekyll Island, either Jekyll or St. Simons, there's a chapel there, a small church building that John Wesley actually had built. Um, and it actually survived the Revolutionary War. Um, so that's John Wesley and the ruins of a church from the Revolutionary period. Just said that. So what we see in Georgia is tremendous growth um, amongst the Baptist church and the Methodist church. If you drive through Georgia today, you are guaranteed to see two churches in every town. You're going to see First Baptist Church and you're going to see First Methodist Church. Always. And sometimes it's kind of funny. You'll see First Baptist Church and then Second Baptist Church. Like they're not good enough to be first, so they're second. Kind of sad, isn't it? What you read, Maddie? Yes, you are. What's she reading? Yeah, I know. All right, so one of the things that we see in Georgia is kind of a cool thing is one of the first African-American churches in U.S. history is established in Savannah. It is named the First Colored Baptist Church. Slavery, still an issue in 1788, of course, um, and just some kind of ground rules. Slaves were not allowed to legally marry. Um, slaves were not supposed to meet in large groups for worship or for any other reason. And so um, it's unusual that slave owners in Savannah actually got together and built a place for um, enslaved people to come and worship. Still there. Um, the building's still there. You can go to Savannah and visit still being used. Um, in Georgia today, the largest Christian denominations are the Baptist and the Methodist. Again, every little town has a Baptist church and a Methodist church. And you actually have different flavors, different varieties of Baptist and Methodist church churches, which is kind of sad, but it is what it is. Mm -hmm. That is one creepy looking peach. Uh, that is actually the um, first colored Baptist church in Savannah. You can go to Savannah. You can go to church on Sunday morning there if you want to. Um, let me ask you an interesting question. Why are there two doors on the front of it? Who are we separating? Who are we segregating? White folks wouldn't go to church here. Men and women couldn't sit on the same pew with each other. You know, you go to church today, mom and dad kind of snuggle up to each other, and maybe if you're little, you know, you snuggle up to your, mm, that wasn't happening. Men sat on one side, women sat on the other side. They did. You act like you don't believe me. Again, creepy peach. All right, so Georgia grows, and as Georgia grows, the leaders of the state, the governor and the Georgia General Assembly begin to look for ways to attract more and more people to come to Georgia because the growth of the state depends on its population and its growth. The more people, the more representation you have, the more people, the bigger tax base you have, and so in order for Georgia to grow, more and more people have to move to Georgia. And Georgia has one thing that people want, and that is land. Remember, from the Savannah River to the Mississippi River, a lot of land, millions of acres that Georgia has to attract people to the state. And they do that in several different ways. Number one is the head right system. We've talked about that before. And until 1803, this is how Georgia distributed land under the headright system. And again, if you were the head of a household, you got 100 acres. 
And then you got 50 acres for every family member up to a limit of 1,000 acres. You even got land based on the number of slaves you had. But again, up to a limit of 1,000 acres. Pretty good deal, don't you think? Yeah. And so the head right system brought people rushing into Georgia. It's like a land rush instead of a gold rush. It's a land rush. And so people immigrate to Georgia simply because they get free land. Now, what are they going to do with that land? They're going to grow crops. They're going to farm for the most part. And what we have from 1782 to 1795, um, really until 1803, is what's called the headright system. And that's everything east of the Oconee River was given away using the headright system. You can see 1802. Um, and then after that, it becomes land lotteries. And we'll talk about those probably tomorrow. Um, and so, again, Georgia is moving toward the west. And the idea is to eventually expand all the way to the Mississippi River. And, of course, that never happens. And it doesn't happen for a couple of reasons. And we'll figure out what those are tomorrow. Okay? Thank uh -huh.